Okay, so today is, there's no new content today. It is just here. It's like a day for you. It's sort of a final exam review lecture. Um, let me get a couple of announcements out of the way. And, um, and then we'll either get through um, kind of the kind of greatest hits from slides that um, I, I think were important from um, past lectures, just as reminders to hopefully generate some new questions, uh, or um, I can just take questions, uh, you know, directly from you that you might have about the, the exam. So the timeline of everything moving forward. So we have our final exam review today, and then uh, Wednesday, or just generically um, your lab day, uh, you, we have at, um, by the Wednesday night. So, and this is a hard deadline, 11.59 PM, your final project presentations, as well as your final project report, um, are due to be uploaded to Canvas um, as group assignments. So only one person in your group will have to upload that and it will count for everyone in your group just you know, for these two things here. So the pr presentations are just 10 minute video presentations uploaded to Canvas uh, there. If uh, you're not you know, sure how to record video or capture screens or anything like that, if you go to the final project presentation, assignment page on Canvas where you upload the presentations. There are instructions there where I give you some tips about how you can use platforms like Zoom or um, you know special tools inside PowerPoint or if you're on a Mac, uh, special tools inside QuickTime that can allow for capturing things a little bit more easily and putting everything together. I did have a question on whether um, uh, we're looking for everyone's video to be on, so your actual cameras to be on. There's no requirement for, for that. All I want you to do is to make an effect video presentation that communicates what you did on your final project, uh, what problem you were solving, um, you know, why simulation was uh, motivating, uh, why you were motivated to use simulation to do that, um, a brief outline of your simulation results and some conclusions about those. Those things you don't need, um, you don't necessarily need um, everyone contributing equally to the presentation. And so, um, and so the, the, uh, there was a question in the chat, can we do the presentations of voice over PowerPoint? That would be fine too. So I just want an effective video media communicating your final project presentation. You don't have to actually have camera captures um, of yourself. Um, and, and so, but just make sure that, um, so sometimes like if you use PowerPoints built in PowerPoint has the ability to, uh, to record audio on top of each slide. The downside of that is sometimes you don't realize that on slide transitions, there's a tiny delay where um, if, you, if you just talk smoothly across the slide transitions, then sometimes um, you get some weird timing effects that, uh, that go on. Um, so if you're on a Windows machine, PowerPoint actually has the ability to capture a whole video screen. So um, I'll do this when I'm in class teaching, if I need to capture the video uh, uh, on, on that machine. So if I wanna capture the lecture, kind of like we do over Zoom now, um, then I can go into PowerPoint. And even while I'm in one PowerPoint, I can create another PowerPoint that just captures the video of the previous one. And then that way I get smooth slide transitions. And I think I talk about those sort of things um, up there on these final project presentations. But the format of the presentation is up to you. There is no requirement for you to use your cameras. It just needs to be an effective, no longer than 10 minute video presentation. And I mentioned before, although I say no longer than 10 minute, if it, you record and it comes down to 10.05 or 10.10 or 10.08 or whatever, you don't have to re-record. You're not going to be deducted for being after 10 minutes, but you can imagine that your evaluator, either me or your other students, is they're going to give you 10 minutes of their time, but then after that, they can feel free to stop listening and then evaluate just the first 10 minutes that are there. So if you go to 10.08, probably somebody's going to listen to the last eight seconds. If you go to 11.30, um, you're probably pushing your luck and you're probably just going to be evaluated on a partial presentation. So that's what I mean by the 10 minute length. Then your final project report. It is a four page um, document that uh, excluding title page and appendix and the, their, the format has been like the sections you need in that report are laid out in a document that is online and so um, you can uh, look online and you'll find that document which says how to set things up and I've got a summary of it on the next slide. Um, I, uh, and I do mention um, on the next slide that I, there is an example report from a previous semester 
But in that previous semester, I actually had a slightly different format. So I put a big caveat that you can look at that report to get an idea of a lot of the sort of basic contents, but the format of that report won't match the format of this report. So this report's format is trying to be streamlined um, because after grading a lot of reports from the previous format, then it, it ended up looking for things in different orders. And that's why we've got this. So it's gonna be a slightly different format, but you still get the basic idea of what would be included in such a final report. So you get all that done Wednesday night. And then Saturday night, you, so then Wednesday by 11.59, you get all that in. And then Wednesday at midnight, so a minute after that, Canvas will randomly assign um, you one random project report and one random project or presentation from another group. And this is an individual assignment. And so then from Wednesday at midnight through Saturday night, you have that time to do a peer review of that. And so what I'm asking each one of you to do, and you do get credit for this, is you watch the 10 minute video and you fill out the rubric. There'll be a rubric on Canvas. There are instructions on how to do this in the peer, in, um, the actual peer review assignment. So you'll go in, you'll fill out the rubric, you'll click the boxes just like you're grading, and then you'll put in a constructive comment and you'll submit that and it's totally anonymous from the other person's end. So they'll see your comment, but they won't see your identity. And then um, you'll do the same thing for the, for the project report. You'll read through their four page report, should be a quick read. You fill out the rubric, you put in a constructive comment, you submit that, your comments and your score will be anonymous to those that are receiving it. Then um, during finals week, I will look at everyone's presentations and everyone's reports and all of the peer reviews. And if um, the peer reviews look like they were constructive, then I'll give everyone their peer review uh, uh, credit. And then I will use the peer review scores along with my own assessments to come up with a grade for everyone's reports and presentations. So that's how the final scores will be done for that final project there. And so that's done with the final project uh, before, of course, Saturday, then on Thursday. So this is still, this um, down here um, is, uh, you know, I, I guess I should probably, you know, I could cross that out. So um, th this is, the way this is written right now, wrote wrong tool. The way this is written right now is for a standard semester. And so this is not, of course, the instructions for this semester. So for this semester, the final exam is slightly different than that. So for this special semester, because we don't have a finals week, on Thursday, you've got your stage one exam that you do individually. You're given 90 minutes to do it online on Canvas with Respondus Lockdown Browser Plus Monitor. And then on Friday, then it's open book, open notes, and even collaborative where you get the exact same exam you took by yourself on Thursday, but you can then take it again. Uh, and the Thursday score will be 80% of your final exam score and the Friday score, which you can then work with your um, 475 students, the ones in the current class. I don't want you collaborating with, uh, you know, Course Hero or any online website and things like Chegg. Um, though that's what I mean by collaborative. You can collaborate with your students. You can use resources on the Canvas site. You can use resources from your books, um, resources from uh, the, the class notes. Um, and then that way, you know, hopefully your stage two exam, it'll pull up your score a little bit based on the stage one. So the stage one, 80%, that's just you on your own with two sheets of scrap paper in Respondus uh, Lockdown Browser. And then stage two, you've got all day to do it. You're not time limited aside. I mean, I got to get it done in that day. But then you can actually collaborate and um, effectively gives you a chance to take the exact same exam again, but um, reflecting on your experience that you had the previous day and then hopefully learning something from your peers as you have questions about that. Um, a lot of you have taken advantage of the late option. And so if you go click on people in Canvas and then click on groups, you can move yourself into the later exam group. And by doing that, then instead of a Thursday, Friday exam, you'll get a Monday, Tuesday exam during the originally scheduled finals week. So everyone has the option to get all of your final done this week, which I had to do. I had to make sure of that because we, we could not put any due dates into final, into finals week because of innovation week. Um, but if you've got a lot of finals this week and you'd prefer, you can take the stage one and stage two Monday and Tuesday of next week 
and um, and you know, but and otherwise the same timing and rules apply. So if you want to do that, then by today, so by the end of the day today, go into Canvas, click people, click groups, and then you can move yourself into the later exam group. And then after today, I'm going to actually form the sections for the exams so that um, those who elected to be in the early group will go into a Thursday, Friday section, and those who are in the later group will go into Monday, Tuesday section. But you got to make your elections today. By default, you're taking it this week. If you elect to move, you can take it next week. Uh, there's a question in the final, do you get two front and back cheat sheets? Yeah, that is, I and mean, I think I mentioned that uh, later on here, but yeah, you'll get, um, it'll be very similar to the midterm. So um, either four single-paged or two double-sided uh, uh, hand produced or manually produced and so i don't want any photocopies or screenshots uh, but you can type it or you can write it out uh, and those will be your sheets of reference that you can use during the exam okay so that is the timeline and um just just to confirm for the final project report uh so uh, the only other final project notes I'll, I'll mention here, just, uh, I mean, right now, I think everybody is in the home stretch of this thing. Uh, if you have not put a sub model into your, um, into your project, you should, because we're kind of looking for a sub model like that's even on the rubric. Um, and so uh, basically, if you've got a complex uh, block diagram, um, if, uh, you know, find a region of the block diagram that you can circle and create a sub model. And that submodel should, you can then put the submodel in, as well as the, the big block diagram, you can still put both of those into your final project report, but the submodel should help make it easier to sort of understand the flow of things so that you don't have to see every detail at the kind of top level diagram. If um, you end up finding there's no room to put a, like that, that there's no real way to make a submodel because you either are, are going to put a submodel around your entire model or you're going to put a submodel around a single block, then in that case, then maybe you've got maybe too simple of a simulation model. Um, but I think in most cases, I think all of you have gotten to the point where, uh, you know, you've got kind of a complex process. Let's say it's the way the burrito is made. Well, you could circle that whole process and say, well, that's the burrito making process and that's your submodel. So just want to make sure that you've got a complex enough model that you could build a submodel into it. Um, otherwise, uh, see the final report document for a detailed um, uh, ex set of expectations for what should be in the final report. Roughly speaking, these are the sections we're expecting, a title page with the team name, um, the, um, uh, or the team members on it, um, as well as we use list stuff for ABET reasons to keep track of if you're an IE major, an EM major, or other. Uh, then uh, an executive summary, that should be a single pref paragraph abstract of the entire report. I should be able to know every single thing you did and the conclusions you made by just reading the executive summary. The executive summary is not an introduction to your report. It is a surrogate for your report. It says it is an, it is an abstract. I should be able to read everything in the executive summary. If I then um, am satisfied, I could, you know, if I'm an executive, I could stop right there and say, based on their recommendations, this is the action I'm taking. If I see something interesting, I want more details in, then I will read the rest of the report. But the executive summary is not meant to be clickbait. It's not meant to be a way to sort of tell me what I'm going to see later. Assume that whoever's reading the executive summary will not read anything else in your report. So it's really got to be a concise one paragraph summary of the problem you had, uh, why you use simulation, the most important results, and, uh, and what conclusions you draw, drew from that results, um, and how that might affect the policy of the stakeholder that's reading the executive summary. Uh, then you're going to, uh, this problem description and research question, that's really kind of like an intro to your report. Uh, the arena model and simulation, simulation methodology, that's like a method where you're going to say um, that, uh, you know, this is the simulation model and these are the elements of the simulation. Uh, then your actual results from the simulation don't go into the arena model section. They go into this summary of experimental results where you actually say, you know, here are some graphs that here are the most important graphs that we'll need in order to talk about our conclusions. And then those conclusions you put in this conclusion section, which tells me what I was supposed to take from the results and what um, intervention you recommend based on those results. And all of this 
um, I would imagine is going to be best suited for a paragraph form. So you'll have the section headers, but inside the sections, I'm not looking for bulleted lists of answers to questions or something like that. This is a report. And so it should be written in kind of a narrative format where you have a couple of paragraphs inside each section and you refer to figures by their name. So you'll say, um, you know, figure one shows uh, the confidence intervals for our as is system and our treatment system, um, showing that there is a significant difference between our treatment system and the as is system. The treatment system is um, significantly slower than the as is system or something like that. So just make sure that it's written like a report that someone would be able to read through um, kind of from top to bottom as opposed to like a bulleted list. And then along with your report, make sure you upload any model files that you have uh, right along there with Canvas. There is a sample final report online, but again, it's in a slightly different format. So just keep that in mind. Don't pattern your report exactly after this one. But if you read about this one, which I think is focused on um, four peaks, um, then you might get some insight into how you could structure some of these sections of the report. All right, so that I think is all of the administrative stuff. So before we move on to the final exam specific things, are there any questions about <clears throat> the final project or the timeline moving forward? Okay, great, great. Um, all right, well then let's um, just to get a, um, since this is the last lecture that I'll see you in here, let's do an attendance exercise just real quick uh, so that we can spend the rest of the time here on these questions. So I put the attendance link in the chat. And so for this attendance exercise, um, my question for you is um, how many pages should the main sections of your final report be? So the question here is how many pages should the main section of your final report be? So not including title page and appendix. So that is your attendance question. Uh, there's a question, would it be possible to open the ICA final review for uh, more attempts just without credit? It should already be available, but under a different name called ICA M uh, practice, ICA MB practice. And so I believe if you go onto Canvas and then click, and I'm just doing this uh, behind the scenes here, so it looks like I'm distracted. I'm just accessing Canvas myself. And so if you go into the 475 uh, on Canvas, and then under, um, I think let's make sure it's under modules. And then if I go to the final exam module, um, unit M2 final exam, then you'll find there is an ICE uh, under the lecture M. So you'll find the lecture M link and then indented under it, you'll find two things. I guess I don't see any um, negative things here. So I'll bring this over here. So in the unit M2 final exam in the module. So we're looking here at the uh, modules and my scroll wheel is not, oh, there it goes. Um, so this is under modules here. So click on modules and then you go down to unit M2 final exam. And there uh, was the ICA MB, which you did before this lecture. But if you look under the lecture M, we've got practice. And these two, this one here is identical to this one up here that you just took, but it doesn't count for credit. So you can take this one, and then this one is the pre midterm topics. So you can feel free to take those as many times as you want, um, I think, up through next week. So if you're having trouble accessing those, let me know, but those are available there and should um, you should feel free to use them. Um, there are some, and I'll mention this on the slides here, there's also some solutions to a few book exercises. There are some sample exams from prior years as well. So that's all there on Canvas. Okay. So any other questions before we move on to final exam specifics? So like I said, this is the old uh, pre-take retake. And so because of this innovation week thing, you know, that's a different format here. So I just didn't bother to update it on these slides because this is a 
special semester. This isn't supposed to be like this other semesters, uh, but the rest of this slide holds. Close book, close notes for, this is at least for the individual portion. For that individual stage one portion, two two-sided handwritten formula sheets. They can be typed, but I just don't want any photocopied uh, material, um, uh, no um, screenshots, those sorts of things. Um, this, um, if we were in class, I would have given this as a, as a Scantron and would have been AB versions. And so that's what this is all about. Of course, the exam this semester is all on Canvas. So it will be Scantron-like, but it is uh, not gonna be a Scantron, obviously. So it'll be the questions that Canvas allows me to, uh, to answer or to ask. Um, so a plausible format structure, you know, it's similar motivations as the midterm. Um, so I'm going to ask some, this is all going to be bundled into uh, where you should definitely be able to finish it within 75 minutes. Um, I try to make it so that, um, you know, some students are going to finish it in a half hour. Some are going to take, you know, um, you know, the full 75 minutes, but maybe on average, it's going to take probably an hour of your time. Uh, and so for the average student, maybe it takes an hour, 50 minutes to an hour. Um, so that's kind of the idea there. Remember, I give you 90 minutes to deal with any particular, any potential technical difficulties that you might have. So um, plausible structure, imagine some true or false or multiple choice questions that are very conceptual. So things about DES fundamentals. Again, think about what we had on the midterm. I asked about entities, resources, uh, but now I can ask about other things like about QQ plots and PP plots and goodness of fit. Um, common probability distributions, um, you know, questions about um, uh, steady state uh, simulations and uh, non-terminating systems and uh, how those two pair together, um, questions about terminating systems and um, uh, transient simulations and um, how uh, those things uh, fit together, um, questions about, you know, uh, what, when, how do you determine the number of replications, uh, you know, what, what things cause you to need more replications or a longer simulation run length. Um, output validation. So um, you know, I might ask questions about when you use a paired uh, t-test versus a two sample t-test. Uh, absolute and relative performance, confidence intervals, VRTs. Um, we didn't talk a lot about VRTs, but um, we did at least spend um, a decent amount of time on CRNs um, and um, a little bit of time on AVs and control variants, and I at least introduced important sampling. So knowing what these four things are used for, like they're used for very different things. Some of them are just for absolute, some are for relative, some are for both. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, when would you apply one or the other? You can imagine some fundamental questions about that. And then something that differs um, from the midterm is you definitely could Imagine seeing me asking some basic arena questions. So here's a particular block. What does it do? Um, here is a set of blocks connected together. Um, you know, uh, you know what, what's missing here? Uh, what block would, where would you expect to find this particular aspect of the model in when, which of these three blocks that are connected together? They're relatively basic arena questions that will show me that you can look at an arena model and follow it through the model. So I'm not going to ask you to draw anything yourself or upload any, you know, it's not a lab practical or something like that, but definitely, you know, you can be able to comprehend arena models and know, you know, where to find how to configure common random numbers using the seeds element. You know, that's, you know, something that would be useful to know. So those are things I could bundle into multiple choice and true false questions. Now, uh, again, this is modulated by the format. So, uh, you know, in a normal semester, it'd be a Scantron format in this semester, it's Canvas, but there will be something that's the spirit of, you know, a short problem. So this might be a short numerical problem where, um, uh, I ask you to do something that will require you to calculate a number, and then that number might be what I ask you about, or uh, so I might have a numerical answer there, but it'll require you to do a little bit of work in order to get there. So, um, you know, you know, short, you know, problems like that. Statistical tests kind of fall into that group as well. So maybe I have you do a, a short uh, power analysis. Uh, maybe I have you do, um, you know, a goodness of fit test, a chi-squared test. Um, maybe I have you do a, a t-test or something like that. Um, the 
if I do ask you to do a statistical test, some of you will be tempted to use uh, you know, the statistical tests on your calculator. Um, you can you know you can do that to check your work, but I can guarantee you that if I'm asking you a question, it's going to be a question that I'm not looking for. Um, I'm not going to be looking for a value that will be easily to calculate on your calculator. So, um, you know, it, it's probably going to be a waste of your time to enter in all of the data that I give you in the test and then have your calculator do a two sample t-test and then spit out a t-value and then expect that you're going to be able to plug that t-value in. I'm probably going to ask you something that's going to be in the guts of the test that sort of forces you to have to do something manually as opposed to dump it into the calculator. Um, also be careful because sometimes I'm gonna ask you questions that require a paired t-test and students who lean on their calculator as a crutch, this happens every semester, um, when something that clearly needs a paired t-test will end up doing something on their calculator with a two sample t-test and get the wrong answer or vice versa. So um, you know, really knowing which test to use and uh, so some calculators don't have a paired uh, t-test. And so they know that I have to take differences and then do a one sample t-test on the calculator if I want the calculator to do it. So I guess in general, um, I am not gonna ask you questions that require a lot of sophisticated calculator use. And if you're doing a lot of sophisticated calculator use, that might be a red flag that you have wandered down a path that will not lead to anywhere good in terms of a good answer. Um, then, you know, there might be uh, slightly longer problems, maybe broken up into a couple of uh, problems because of the, you know, the canvas-based format, but design problems. So think about random variant generators and things like that. So, you know, that might involve some, you know, make sure you still remember how to calculate a CDF from a PDF and how to invert a CDF. Um, but you might think I might throw in something where on top of generating a random variant generator, you're going to be asked to apply condom, com, common random numbers to the random variant generator. So I might give you a string of numbers, and you're going to have to need to know that if I've got two random variant generators and I'm doing common random numbers, I run same the number into both generators as opposed to running one random number into one generator and another random number into the other gener uh, generator. So there's ways that I can merge things that you were doing pre-midterm with things that you did post-midterm. Um, there are practice problems, like I pointed out on Canvas. These are available in that midterm module. That midterm module, you need to make sure that you take that final exam respondus Locktown browser compliance test. Uh, so I'm looking on Canvas right now. It looks like uh, 34 students have taken it, which is pretty good, but there's still a handful of you that have not. And so make sure you take that final exam Lockdown browser compliance test, and that will unlock the final exam module that gives you access to all these practice problems. Um, there are sample midterm and final exams that you feel free to study from. They have solution sets that are available on Canvas. Some of the older ones don't have solution sets because I used to just grade them without a solution set. And uh, so all I had was the ungraded uh, format. Um, so now I've been trying to save solution sets for your reference. And so the newer ones do have solution sets. So the older ones might still be useful, but I just don't have a solution set because I just, you know, just graded it, you know, uh, by you know, just by uh, site. Um, so then um, homeworks. Um, these are some homeworks that I think you know, you know, look into D two and G three. Those are good ones to review. Um, uh, look into C two, um, but generalize to other distributions. And so this KS test was originally about uniformity. Well, now we know how to apply the KS test for other distributions. Um, definitely remember how to do hand simulation that you did in that first homework, homework B1. Um, you know, and then uh, bias issues that were brought up in homework J2, then those are you know good things to be thinking about. I put um, a document that has a few additional problems from banks on it um, and a couple of solutions to these things. So those are available in the midterm study module as well. And the other thing is if you don't like the way I've presented things, remember that a, a, every lecture has a chapter from the textbook associated with it on Canvas. And so uh, if you have a question about something that it just watching the video is not really, I'm just not doing it for you, then go to that chapter 
and see how the uh, banks at Al, um, see how they presented it. And maybe they do it better than I do. And so that is another great uh, set of material to look at. All right, so um, before I get into, you know, asking you for any specific questions that you have, are there any general, I mean, so I guess now is a good time for questions. And so at this point, um, do you have any questions for me? If not, I have kind of, uh, you know, I just have slides from previous lectures that, again, I pulled out that I think are good to highlight stuff that we've done all throughout the semester that I think you should have uh, be, com be comfortable with before the final exam. But if you have specific things you'd like to ask or for me to go over, this would be a great time to bring those up. Anybody? And I'll bring my meeting pulse back up just in case anyone submits something there. If I can find it. Okay, so no questions thus far. Nothing in the meeting pulse. All right, so the way I've got things organized here, just stop me if, um, if a question does come up. Uh, it doesn't have to be related to what's on the screen. I just started from way back in the beginning of the class and, uh, and just picked out things that I thought were important and I highlight what lecture that they're from here. So like what type of, you know, remember, go back and think about what are models. And so this what if question definition, why did I even bring the what if question definition up? The George Box quote about all models are wrong, uh, but some are useful. What does that mean? Um, and how did it apply to simulation modeling? You can imagine I get general questions about modeling that could come up. Um, specific questions about discrete event system simulation modeling. So just the basics, you know, what are these things, entities, attributes, resources, um, you know, what are these um, components that you see inside discrete event system simulations, events, activities, delays? What's the difference between an activity and a delay? I'm hoping that now that you've done your final project that you have a much more visceral feel for what an activity is versus a delay. You know, the things that you actually programmed into ARENA, those were the activities. The things that you measured after you ran your simulation, those were the delays. So hopefully is, uh, is clearer now. Um, hand simulation. So, um, you know, linking this back to ARENA, now that we know about ARENA, the little step button in ARENA down here actually goes through and steps through every step of a discrete event system simulation the same way you did by hand. So there is actually a way in ARENA to view the event calendar and then click this step button and see it generate effectively every row that you generated here by hand. So, um, so what you were doing is, is really what's going on inside ARENA. So um, being able to understand hand simulation is being able to trust in what and understanding what ARENA is doing, which is why I want you to make sure that you know how to do a hand simulation. So, um, you know, this is just highlighting this idea of activities can be inter-arrival times, activities can also be service times. Uh, these are the durations that you know ahead of time, or you can at least draw from a random distribution without running the whole simulation. The things that you need the simulation for, those are the delays and they create gaps in between activities and the way those gaps come together end up um, really defining the performance of the system as we've designed it. And so this fundamental difference between activities and delays is super important. So any questions about basic model modeling uh, fundamentals? Did that exercise any demons that need to come out? Okay. Um, the other things to brush up on uh, back from lecture D1 and D2, uh, when we started talking about probabilistic input models. So know what input modeling is and then start, uh, you know, have sort of an idea that like, oh, an exponential distribution looks like this. An exponential distribution is the best distribution I should use if all I know is the average and that the um, values I want are non-negative. And so, um, especially now when some of you didn't have the opportunity to take data from inside 
stores that you were modeling, um, then some of you found that you had to approximate the processes you assumed were going inside the store just using summary statistics that you found or cooked up elsewhere. So you didn't actually know the distribution of time it takes to make a cappuccino. But you could look up online and says, well, you know, on average, a cappuccino takes a minute to make. And so given that all I know is that it's not going to take a negative amount of time, and on average, it takes a minute to make a cappuccino, then I am going to use an exponential distribution for cappuccino times in my simulation model. And I am going to make that average be the average that I looked up elsewhere. And sometimes that's the best you can do. So knowing what um, you know, some of these models, if I know the average and I know the standard deviation, and um, I I'll do allow for some negatives, then a normal distribution is what you should be using. So knowing these distributions and what they're for, what is a Bernoulli distribution? What is a negative binomial and so on and so forth? These are you know, good things to know. Um, so the common distributions and their parameters um, and so on. And so um, I've list some of the common distributions in the next slide here. This is the basic overview of the process of stochastic modeling, where we have realistic input models generate variation inside what would otherwise be a pretty deterministic outline of how things flow from one spot to another. And so the randomness is generated when we flip coins, when we get decision branches, or when we decide how long things linger in particular areas. That's what generates the variation on our output. So we get realistic variations on inputs to hopefully generate realistic variations on outputs so that our simulation becomes a good surrogate for a real world system. And the distributions that I think you should definitely feel comfortable with after this class on the continuous side are these six, on the discrete side are these five. Um, and you should also be comfortable with the Poisson counting process. And so this basic idea that a Poisson process is like two random variables in one. It is a Poisson discrete random variable, which is the count of events that happen in any interval of time. It is also an exponential random variable, which represents the time in between those events that happen in the counting process. So that's an important thing to know from probability there. Um, if you need a brush up on these six, um, then I kind of, you know, have a, a little, you know, I don't know, one sentence explanation of the six that are here. Um, likewise with the discrete here. So it's meant to help you as a little study guide. So any questions about probabilistic modeling? Or anything else, just in general, if this, um, leads you to say, you know what, I really don't remember that very well, or that reminds me that I don't remember this other thing that, that we actually just learned about last week. Can I ask about that now? That's, well, feel free to do so. All right, um, so then random number generations and random variant generation, the last thing we did before the midterm, um, definitely this is a major part of um, stochastic simulation. Now, I won't go into as many details maybe on the final exam, so I probably am not going to ask you to verify that a set of random numbers from a random number generator is uniformly distributed using a chi-squared test. Um, like I said, if I ask you about chi-squared tests, it's probably gonna be about a more general distribution. So I might say, um, here's a triangular, uh, we're expecting these data to be triangular distributed. Um, here are the actual data. Use a chi-squared test to verify whether they um, fit, uh, whether a triangular distribution is a good fit to these data. Um, so that would be how I'd like ask the chi-squared thing. But there are still more fundamental questions about random number seeds. Uh, what are the, the properties that we expect from a, um, a random number generator? You know, we expect it to have uniformity and independence. Um, what is, um, you know, what is the general format of a linear congruential generator? So I still think it is probably important for you to be able to generate one pseudo-random number yourself using an LCG. Um, you know, why do we have combined linear congruential generators? If an LCG gives us independence and uniformity, then why do we bother with a combined LCG? Um, random variant generation, I think this is a little bit more important for you to remember um, because uh, you frequently have to come up 
with random variant generators. Um, some of you might have found that you had to do that, where you had data that you just couldn't find a good model from. So you used an empirical distribution, an empirical CDF inside Arena to draw from it. So understanding random variant generation, um, I definitely think this is something that would be more prominent on the final than the random number generation. Um, and I just kind of go over some basic pointers for random number generation, LCGs, and then uh, random variate generation. And my favorite topic for random variate generation is the inverse transform method, because it is just so useful and uh, it's so fundamental to so many things. And so make sure you understand the inverse transform method in both its continuous form um, here, as well as its discrete form uh, over here. And, uh, and I mentioned you can also uh, use the discrete inverse transform method to um, effectively draw from empirical CDFs. And so if you have a CDF that you don't have a good model from, you can turn an empirical CDF into a discrete uh, CDF and then draw from it. And so um, I know some of you have actually done that in your models. Uh, so, um, so that's just a review of that there. So any questions about that? I think that's all of the uh, pre-midterm material before post midterm and of course post midterm we sort of shifted off and became very statistical focused and less probability focused as you're thinking um you know i asked you i think during some of the attendance exercises which one of these is a pdf which one of these is a cdf i could also ask which one of these is an inverse cdf i think being able to spot those that, you know, do this exercise, that's probably something that would be a good thing to know how to do for a final exam. You could imagine me asking something like that on a final exam. Same thing with a group like this. Which one is a PDF? Which one is likely a CDF? Which one is likely an inverse CDF, otherwise known as a quantile function? So that's something else that I uh, recommend knowing about. All right, getting into post midterm material. Um, lectures um, H, I, J1, and J2, I made use of these diagrams, this curve here. I talked about the receiver operating characteristic curve, the ROC curve, and I talked about how it just plots the type 1 error versus 1 minus the type 2 error, which is otherwise known as the statistical power. And so this kind of helps us understand the trade-off between type one error and type two error, where the type two error is kind of flipped here because I'm using statistical power uh, on this axis. And, uh, and basically the, the way the, any single hypothesis test you have, a chi-squared test, a t-test, anything, a Kolmogorov smirnov test, all of them are gonna have a threshold for evidence where if you, your evidence that you've gathered from the data is above that threshold, you make one decision. If it's below that threshold, you make another decision. So that's like your critical chi-squared value. As you sweep that variable or that critical value close to zero or close to infinity, what you're doing is changing the type one error. And by changing the type one error, you are implicitly also changing the statistical power. And every single hypothesis test has this um, general characteristic where if you increase type 1 error, you will also increase statistical power. In other words, you decrease type 2 error. And even when you just have a random, the worst hypothesis test ever is just a coin flip. You say, you know, um, you know, is if somebody shows you, um, you know, uh, a puppy and says, will this puppy be a barker when they be when they becomes an adult? Um, you know, if you flip a, that's a, you know, you could, you've got a data, the puppy right in front of you. You can use information about that puppy, like its breed, in order to make a guess as whether it does, it'll do a lot of barking. Or you could just flip a coin. And if you flip a coin, it comes up heads, you say, yes, it'll be a barker. And then tails, and it comes down and say, oh, no, it won't be a barker. Well, that would be like um, having a fair coin. Um, and that would sort of having a, that would have a 50% type one error and a 50% type two error be right here in the middle. If you made it an unfair coin, so it comes up heads more often than tails, then you slide up this. And so you can actually make your type one error um, large and your type two error small or vice versa. 
But so this diagonal line here, even it has this same trend where it shows there's a trade-off between type one error and type two error. But the point of a good hypothesis test is to use evidence to lift you off that line so that you're this bent shape over here. So that as you adjust the thresholds, you end up following this curve and not this flat line over here. And where does this trade-off come from? It comes from these overlapping curves that I'm kind of showing up here, which hopefully you were introduced to in like 380 or 385, uh, where you've got a set of statistical values you would expect if your hypothesis is true. And then if it's not true, you could imagine an alternative would generate a set of statistical values. And some of those statistical values will overlap with the values you get if it were true, whereas other ones will never occur if um, the hypothesis that you're testing is true. And so this idea that you have outcomes that uh, overlap and don't overlap sets up your false positive rate, your, your true positive rate, your true negative rate, your false negative rate. And they all represent different areas under these overlaps. And as you slide these things apart, then you're changing, um, or as you slide this decision threshold around, then you are changing um, where you are on this ROC curve. And if you add samples that give you more statistical power, what you're effectively doing is taking these two humps and separating them apart. And that is going to change your ROC curve, giving you uh, effectively bending it farther up so that you manage to get more statistical power for the same type one error. So understanding this slide, if you know, if you look at this slide and say, I got it, I really understand it, you're in really excellent shape. That's where I would love you to be coming out of this class. So that's my aspirational goal. And that's why this is a great study guide, this slide. And this is just um, you know, summarizing some of those things. So being able to understand the difference between type one error and type two error and how statistical power is um, one minus type two error. Um, you know, know the statistical lingo. What does it mean to reject a null hypothesis? Um, so well, what is this null hypothesis? Being able to know which hypothesis is the null and which is the alternative. So if you're testing for uniformity, then the null hypothesis is uniformity. And we um, may actually view a detection of a difference from uniformity, um, although um, we, would, we refer to that as a positive result because we detected a difference. And that's good that we saw the difference. But it's actually bad for my random number generator because my random number generator should have given me uniform random numbers. So this idea between you know that positive um, means we've detected a difference from the null. It doesn't mean it was a good result. Um, you know, um, so, and this is just summarizing some of the things I've said on that previous slide. So any questions about the basic statistical methodology? Okay. All right, great. Well, maybe just to keep uh, everybody awake, um, let's do um, let's do another just attendance exercise. It also gives people time to kind of think. I'll put the link back in the chat, and uh, maybe the question for this one is: um, uh, What is the relationship between statistical power and type two error? So you can put that in as your attendance question answer. So the link is in the chat and the question is typed in the chat there as well. So I will scroll back up to where I left off. All right, so, uh, so moving forward from that, after we got over the basic stats stuff, then, um, in lecture G, uh, we started talking about, um, or unit G, input modeling. And so gaining insight from a histogram. So we talked about rules for choosing the right number of bins for a histogram. Um, you know, um, we talked about uh, making sure you can spot whether data are discrete or continuous. 
um, and then knowing that that's a good place to start to then figure out which distribution am I going to fit to these data because discrete distributions are very different than continuous distributions. Knowing about QQ plots and PP plots and how they give you a visu visual idea of a fit before you go on and do a uh, goodness of fit test. So, um, you know, the continuous versus discrete and so just a reminder of that. Um, you know, how do you justify your choices? So. Uh, for a normal distribution, um, there are actually um, rational explanations for why you would expect a normal distribution to fit a particular physical process. So do you expect this process that you're modeling to be symmetric? Um, so to be bell-shaped? Do it expect it to maybe be the sum of independent random variables? So if you're modeling a, um, a, a food item as it's being made and you there's no queuing in between stations so it really is the fact that um oh i'm sorry someone posted a question uh into the um meeting pulse and i apologize for not seeing that i'll get to that in just one second um that um if uh if you've got a uh if you've got a process where let's say someone is following the order through the process then in that case, you know, there's not going to be delays in between each item. Someone puts out, somebody cuts the bread and they move over and they layer, um, you know, the toppings on the bread and they move over and they toast the bread and they toast with the toppings and they add the untoasted toppings. If all those things, if there's no delay in between them, then you can model that entire process as an additive process in which um, even though each individual process might be exponentially distributed, the sum of all of those independent processes may actually look like a bell shape. And so you might say that although cutting the bread, I might model exponentially, making the entire sandwich, I might choose to model with a normal distribution, which is safe to do if my standard deviation is small enough that almost no out outcomes will end up being negative. So, you know, justifying your choices of these distributions. There was a question in the meeting pulse um, where the um, where they say, just to clarify, the final exam on Thursday um, uh, or Monday that we take is on our own is taking during. Uh, so, there's a question on, on whether you take the independent exam during class or um, or on your own timing. It's not during class but it is, there is a 90 minute window. So basically early Thursday morning, so basically Wednesday night, things open up so that uh, Thursday morning, you have 24 hours to start the exam. And anytime during that day, when you start the exam, the instant you start it, you have to complete it in the next 90 minutes. And you have to complete it before that 24 hours ends. So those are your two timing constraints. You do not need to take it during the exam time. You take it whenever you would like, but whenever you do take it, you take it through Respondus Lockdown Browser. It is the identical setup that we had um, during for the midterm that we took earlier in the semester. Okay, so thanks for that question. Sorry that I missed it the first round. Yeah, so just I just mentioned a couple of other distributions here and justifications for why you would use them. Um, QQ plot versus PP plot. Um, so uh, you usually do a QQ plot first to get a kind of a coarse grained feel of what distribution is right, and then a PP plot to get a more fine grained discrimination among things that don't shake out in the QQ plot. So um, I you know, give some examples of that that you can go back to those lectures to kind of go into there. Um, know your summary statistics, know that uh, the formula for variance is divided by n minus one and not n. Um, that's maybe an important thing. Um, try to recall your maximum likelihood estimators and what the kind of purpose of those are. So if you have the PDF and you have data, the maximum likelihood estimator is a great way to fit the uh, optimal set of parameters to the data you have. If you are absolutely sure that that is the best distribution for those data. Um, I list some maximum likelihood estimators for common distributions here, um, just uh, as a review. Um, know how to use the chi-squared test to, for goodness of fit. It's very similar to what you did during the midterm, but you just change the expected number. And so if I were to give you a CDF for your 
uh, expected distribution for the distribution we're testing, then when you cut your interval up, you can then calculate the probability that a, an outcome will fall in a particular box by evaluating the CDF at the upper limit of that box minus the CDF at the lower limit of that box. And that'll give you a probability that any outcome will fall in that bin. If you then multiply that probability by the total number of samples, then you get the expected number of samples you would have expected in that bin. And that's what you end up plugging into your chi-squared. Otherwise, the chi-squared operates pretty much similar to exactly what we did when we tested for uniformity. The only other wrinkle is if in order for you to choose your CDF here, you had to estimate a parameter from the data. So you might have had to estimate the mean in order to then, then say, OK, so for my exponential, I need to figure out the mean for the exponential. I'm going to estimate that from data and then use that to generate the CDF that has that the matching mean. Well, in that case, your degrees of freedom that you use when you when you go and find your critical chi-squared value is going to be reduced by every estimated parameter. So if you estimate one parameter, the degrees of freedom is going to be n minus two. If you estimate uh, two parameters, n minus three, and so on. If you don't estimate any parameters, and so just like on the homework, if you say, I'm telling you that I want you to test. This is a Poisson distribution with this mean too. I don't care what the mean of the data of I are. Uh, I want you to just test a Poisson with mean two. I've given you the mean. If I've given you it, it's not been estimated from data, then the degree to freedom is just n minus one. But once you start estimating a parameter, every parameter you estimate ends up uh, decreasing those degrees of freedom, which will affect the critical value that you'll look up when you um, evaluate whether this chi-squared value is too large or just small enough. So that's your chi-squared test. Um, also, the kolmogorov smirnov test. So remember how to generalize it. It works exactly like the KS test from before the midterm, except now, instead of putting your data in the middle row, you put the CDF of your data. So you've got your data points that I've given you. You've got your hypothetical CDF. You just pipe that data, which you can sort. It's probably a good idea to sort. Um, this row has to be sorted. So you either sort before or after you do it. But um, you can take that sort of data, pipe it into the hypothetical CDF that you're testing, and that will generate numbers between 0 and 1. Those go into the middle row, then otherwise you just do the chi or the Kolmogorov Smirnov test exactly as you did before the midterm to test for uniformity. When you're testing for uniformity, the CDF is the identity function, and that's why um, this drops away and just becomes XI here, because the CDF for a uniform distribution is just a ramp with slope of one. And so F of XI just ends up being XI if these XI numbers are already uh, you know, distributed between zero and one, I'm testing for uniformity. So that's um, why this is just a generalization of everything you've done before the midterm. Um, I mentioned there's a couple of other tests. Um, I'm not gonna ask you to know how to do them, but just know that there, um, there are other tests out there and we choose tests based on their statistical power. And so for goodness of fit tests, we care about having the highest statistical power possible. And that's because high statistical power or high sensitivity means that we can trust a negative result with low amounts of data. So normally you get a negative result um, and you say, I can't tell the difference between these data and my hypothesis, that doesn't mean my hypothesis is right. That might just mean I don't have enough data. If you have high statistical power, then you do say, you know, actually I have confidence that my hypothesis is true. And so um, the Anderson-Darling test has higher statistical power. And so you're gonna see that in statistical packages for doing goodness of fit. Um, if you know you specifically want to test for normality, there are tests that are built just for the normal distribution that have even higher statistical power, like the Shapiro-Wilk test. So this idea that I add assumptions in order to gain statistical power, um, so in this case, I'm testing only for normality, 
And so I get more statistical power and that allows me to conclude that something is normal without actually having to get a lot of data. And so I can have confidence in that. So this idea that you look for tests based on the desired statistical power, and in some cases based on the amount of data that you have available. So, um, you know, if I look back at the chi-squared test, I need a, a lot of data to be available for the chi-squared test to work. I need the expected number of outcomes to be at least five in every bin. That might be a lot of data to make the chi-squared test work. The Kolmogorov-Smirnov test, I don't need that much data for, so it has much higher statistical power. Um, but <clears throat> I can't really use it when I'm estimating parameters. So I'm estimating parameters with the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test I have to use certain modifications to the KS test to make it work that we don't even cover in this class. So the KS test is great for low numbers of samples, but you can't use it with estimated numbers of parameters. The Anderson-Darling test um, and is another test that's great for um, very few uh, numbers of samples, um, uh, has great statistical power, um, but uh, is, um, uh, so it's less likely to fail to reject a false null. So, um, so that's, you know, and then if I want to step that up even further, if I really just care about normality, then there's this beautiful Shapiro Wills test. For very few samples, I can get normality. If I don't, um, you know, so, so it's, it's, you know, why do we have all these tests? It's, it all comes down to, to the economics of sampling, basically. All right, so any questions about that, about, um, you know, unit G and um, input modeling and goodness of fit tests. We have about 12 minutes left in class. And again, I'm just going through what I think are highlights of the past, um, the past units. Oh, and there was a question. Why do you have to sort that row? I'm sorry that I missed that question. So the question here was, why does this row have to be sorted? Um, it, <clears throat> the, the magic of the Kolmogorov-Smirnov test is it tells you where a particular outcome should be based on its position in the ranking. So um, if I have five data points, then what the, the earliest data point I'm expecting, this is like actually a quantile explanation here. So you can, maybe that's a good way to view this. If I have five data points and I sort them, I expect the first data point to be in the 20th quantile. In other words, um, uh, I expect um, that there is um, going to be um, the, um, the, I expect that that this first data point will be less than the the uh, the twentieth percentile. So the twentieth percentile of my hypothetical distribution um, should be greater than the 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 first data point in my sorted order. So my sorted order should be less than eighty percent of the rest of my data. That's basically what I'm saying here. And so by sorting the data and then running them through the CDF, this um, effectively maps them to, um, to a quantile. It, it maps them um, to you know, saying that, well, okay, this data point here, let's say this data point was 20. Well, this 20, um, what it's gonna show up in the CDF here, that's gonna actually say that 10% of data are less than 20. And so that is between zero and 20%. And so that's where we, I kind of expect it to be. If this instead were to come out and be 0.6, then that is outside of the interval I expected it to be in. So the first point is expected to be in the range from zero to one over the number of data. The second point is expected to be in the range from one over data to two over uh, the number of data and so on. And so this, uh, the reason this has to be sorted is by sorting it, then it allows me to, to, to compare the position in the sorted list with the expected cumulative uh, probability for that particular outcome. Does that make sense? So I sort it effectively to generate a cumulative and empirical CDF and then I use the uh, Kolmogorov-Smirnov test 
to compare the empirical CDF to the expected CDF. And you have to sort to generate an empirical CDF. So that was a question that came over the meeting pulse. Um, if that doesn't make sense, feel free to reach out um, after. All right, any other questions about those tests? Okay. All right, so um, the uh, last couple of units had to do with um, out, uh, verification, validation, and calibration, and estimating absolute and relative performance. So there's not a whole lot I'm gonna say here. I would definitely know the difference between verification and validation, and maybe the nuance of the process of calibration, where calibration is this kind of cyclic process of making your model better and better and better, um, more and more like the real world. Verification is getting the bugs out of your code. Validation is making sure that the model that you've captured um, in your simulation is actually a good representation of the real world. So verification is debugging, validation is making it um, actually you know, tie back to the real world. Um, then relative and absolute performance. Um, you know, talking about point estimators, no difference between, you know, know what a quantile estimator is, um, arithmetic mean. So, you know, when most of our estimators are mean estimators, um, you know, uh, know that every estimator outcome has its own sampling distribution. And that is the big reason why we need interval estimators. Because if I run an experiment um, twice, then the estimate I get from experiment one is gonna be different than the exponent, er, ex experiment I get from experiment two. I don't have the budget to run uh, the experiment multiple times. And so instead I run the experiment once and I generate a confidence interval. And that confidence interval um, gives me an idea of the variation I would get if I were to run the experiment over and over again. And so we know that our confidence intervals basically are that if I run a hundred experiments, a 95% uh, percent confidence interval um, says that 95 of the 100 confidence intervals that you generated will capture the real performance variable you're trying to estimate with your simulation model. So that basic idea of an interval estimator, um, you know, and how it relates um, to this idea of variation across experiments is important to know. And then the relationship between interval estimators and t-tests is important to know. The standard confidence interval that you hear about is just a visualization of a t-test, a geometric interpretation of a t-test. I didn't talk about it as much, but I did bring up the prediction interval, which is another confidence interval, whereas the confidence interval is a measure of error. Um, the prediction interval is, um, is a measure of, of risk. So the confidence interval is how likely is it that I capture the point that you care about? The prediction interval is how likely that I capture the interval of all the future runs of this simulation. Um, absolute performance and, um, you know, we talked about transient simulations and how we do transient simulations for terminating systems. And in, um, and so, you know, the number of replications was kind of the big question. We had a formula that involved pilot data on variance and that helped us figure the number of replications. Um, we then also talked about steady state simulations of non-terminating systems where we do care about the number of replications, but we also care about whether um, we should just run each replication longer. And also the big important thing, how long of a warm-up period do we need to prevent from introducing bias in our steady state outputs? Uh, then in relative performance, you know, that's where we started introducing the paired difference t-tests the two sample t-tests, both the pooled and the uh, unpooled versions based on um, what variance form you use. Um, we, um, we talked about um, you know, confidence intervals again and how you can generate a confidence interval from a two sample t-test as well and then compare it to zero. The multiple comparison uh, it came up, um, it came up in labs as well 
where if you are comparing a simulation based on multiple performance criteria, then if you're looking for a difference, you've got to divide by the number of comparisons. That's the Bonferroni correction. So if I'm measuring um, the time and system as well as the utilization simultaneously, trying to see if I see a difference from my as-is system to my treatment system, um, I have to use an alpha divided by two because I'm doing two comparisons there. And um, if I'd use my normal alpha, then both of those statistical tests together as a family um, can end up committing this, the, the effect of phishing, where I end up finding a difference by chance um, so that my type one error rate for the whole family will be much higher than my desired type one error rate. Um, variance reduction techniques, and that's the last thing we went over. So because I only have a couple of minutes, um, I won't go into anything in detail here because we've spent a lot of time talking about the VRTs. But just so you know, I do have um, some slides here um, that are meant to kind of um, you know help think about that. Um, the arena basics, I kind of also have some study guide slides here about arena basics, things that I think you could go through and um, just make sure that you can basically go through this slide, which is available on Canvas, and that you feel comfortable with each one of these bullets. Um, so um, I think that's pretty much it. So um, I will do the last attendance exercise, and then I'd be happy to take any last lingering questions that you might have. So the attendance... Um, URL is in the chat. And the final question that I have um, will be, um, I'll say, um, how, when is the last day that you can elect to take the exam in the later period? So that is my question for you to put in your attendance exercise. So with that, that's all I've got for you. Are there any questions, anything else you'd like me to clarify or go over? Looking forward to seeing your final projects. Again, lots of sample material online, uh, sample final exams. Go back and look at the sample midterms too. Those are good study materials. Uh, those practice ICAs are available. Make sure to do that um, lockdown browser compliance test as well. And I can put that question slide up there as well if anybody is just shy about asking a question in these last couple of minutes. All right, only a couple more left in the class. There's a minute left of regulation, so I'll hang out here for that. It looks like we are at regulation. So if the three that are left, if nobody's got any other questions, then I will end the meeting and wish you good luck.